on today's show, a roster move for the Atlanta Hawks, adding Jarrett Culver, a former top prospect, to the mix on a two-way contract, and then a two-part deep dive with two panelists, Andrew Kelly and Tower Jones, fan favorites, friends of the podcast. We'll have all of that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1309 of the Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Tuesday evening into Wednesday. And thank you for joining us, as always, on the podcast and making us your first listen each and every day. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, as well as Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and wherever you like to listen to podcasts or even watch them on the video side. This is a podcast that actually is going to be audio only for the most part. Uh, you saw the intro if you are watching on YouTube, but this is a three-man podcast with myself and Andrew Kelly, as well as Tyler Jones, a roundtable of sorts, and it was easier on this particular occasion to go audio only, so my apologies on that, but on YouTube, you'll see the background and get all the same audio content that you're looking for from this podcast. That's coming up in a moment, and it's going to be two parts. This is part one you're listening to right now, and then part two will follow right behind it on this same podcast feed, so do not forget to go to part two at the end of this show. But first, before I bring in my guests on today's podcast, a little bit of news to hit on. From Monday, actually, as we recorded on Sunday about Shondi Brown, uh, news speculating that we could have a little bit more to talk about in the coming days. And when we're broke on Sunday, that the Hawks were making uh, the move to wave Sean D. I discussed some options with the two-way slot. And one of them was that the Hawks could already have a player lined up to sign in Sean D. Brown's place. That ended up almost certainly being the case on Monday when the Hawks added Jarrett Culver on a two-way deal uh, playing alongside Trent Forrest on both the two-way slots for the Hawks. Culver is a very famous player compared to most guys on a two-way deal because he was the number six, number six overall pick in the 2019. 20- 19 NBA draft. He's even more well known to Hawk fan, Hawks fans because he was one of the guys that was in Atlanta's range in that class. And the Hawks famously had a couple of high picks in that draft, ended up trading up for DeAndre Hunter and drafting Cam Reddish as well. But Culver was definitely in the mix all the way around. I talked about him a lot on this podcast uh, before and during that draft cycle. Needless to say, he was available on a two way contract. So things have not gone super well for Culver at the NBA level so far. He is still 23 years old, and that is clearly the Hawks sort of buying low on a guy who still has some real talent and pedigree as a former top six pick in the draft not too long ago. He played 37 games for the Grizzlies last season, played about nine minutes a game for Memphis. Worth noting that the Grizzlies were very deep last year, so that's not a huge um, issue as why he wasn't playing all that much, but not a, still a pretty small sample size for a player of his stature. Started his career in Minnesota when they made a trade with the Phoenix Suns on draft night. Culver has played in 134 games at the NBA level and 42 starts in the NBA for Culver. His appeal as a prospect was kind of like that archetypal two-way wing player, 6'6 wing, good athlete. He was effective in college as a shot creator and as a defender. The big thing in the NBA that has not worked is his shot creation and his scoring ability. He has struggled on the whole in the NBA for sure. Part of that is that he's not really a guy who has a huge calling card right now to lean on. He's more of like sort of that jack of all tra- trades, master of none kind of player at this point in time. He's a pretty good defender. That's probably his best appeal right now is defensively. He's a, a good athlete, pretty instinctual defensively. That's pretty valuable, but also is not like an elite defender either. So, and the offense has been a struggle to this point. He has some pretty good instincts as a passer and both the Grizzlies and Wolves at least tried at times, give him the ball a little bit more as a playmaker. But at this point, he's not had the gravity as a scorer to command that kind of attention from defenses and his support skills have not really played up to that point as well. The biggest question with Culver still is his jump shot. It has not worked at all. That was one of the at least question marks, concerns coming out of college about Culver and particularly for his upside. But it's been worse than even people that were skeptical of Culver thought it might be. He has a career 28% three-point shooter at this point. Only 47% on twos as well. He's clearly been lost with his jump shot. That is very, very clear on film. Also, with just like the stories that you read about Culver and kind of maybe losing his confidence a little bit. He is shooting 99 out of 199 at the free throw line. So a shade under 50% at the line for a perimeter player is not what you want to see for especially a guy who was uh, formerly had some really high hopes coming into the draft. So needless to say, the broken jump shot is the biggest question and it's really the only way I can see him having a real path to like being a real rotation player in the NBA is to fix his jumper on some level Um, that's the biggest task and we'll see if the Hawks have a plan to go ahead and sort of break that down and build it back up I liked him a lot as a prospect I will definitely be uh, candid about that I had him way too high 
on my board had number four in that draft class and actually had Hunter number five. So they were side by side the entire way after the consensus top three of Zion and John Morant and RJ Barrett. It was basically for me a battle between those two guys most of the cycle. And uh, obviously Culver went after Hunter, but I had those guys side by side. That was not a, not a great situation right now for me. Still, um, I think there are still reasons to buy low on Culver, keeping expectations very low. This is a two-way contract. Um, if he's playing this year for the Hawks, things have gone a little bit awry in some respects. But I also think that there are no, because there are no expectations really at all, and he's just more talented than someone like Shawnee Brown is, even though I do like Shawnee Brown and what he can bring. If your choices are Jarrett Culver or Shawnee Brown, I'd rather have Culver for that developmental upside, potentially. I'll be interested to see kind of what they do with his jump shot at this point in time. He did show some touch at the college level, and that, that's obviously the swing skill for him. The Hawks are still lean different defense, though, with their peripheral guys. You know, they've signed Culver now to this deal. They signed Trent Forrest, as a, it was a defense-first player on the perimeter. They signed Chris Silva to an Exhibit 10 contract as a defense-first guy very clearly. Really, only Tyson Etienne is, like, not a huge defensive-first player that they've kind of signed on the periphery this time around. So I say this a lot, but there are multiple paths you can take with a two-way contract, basically. The Hawks have kind of done all of them throughout the course of the Travis Schlenk era. You can kind of go with the low ceiling guys like your Shawnee Brown types who kind of plug and play. Um, they can play some minutes if you need them. Trent Forrest is kind of like that, but a little, I would say a little bit more upside than Shawnee Brown would have had, but um, certainly more of a plug and play guy still, uh, you know, defensively, etc. cetera. Um, or you can go kind of upside swing with like the Hawks did with Sharif Cooper. That didn't work out for the Hawks, but uh, that was obviously what that was about. He fell too far on the draft. The Hawks knew it. They kind of took him on a flyer and wanted to see if that would pan out. And then you kind of go in the middle, and that's what Jarrett Culver basically is, or maybe something, maybe kind of what Trent Forrest is, but mostly what Culver is, and that the upside is still there on some level, um, not star upside. I want to be very clear about that. It's more upside of like if this hits and you can fix his jump shot, he can become a quality rotation player. Um, the it would be wise, I think, at this point to kind of forget that he was a former top six pick and treat him like a developmental prospect. That's what he is at this point in time. So throw it out the window. Obviously, he's still 23 years old, though. He's a good athlete. He has good pedigree. He has an interesting skill set. And hope that that well-rounded package can kind of work out if he can fix his jump shot. But obviously, that is the big thing. Because if he's going to shoot like this, he's not really an NBA player at this point in time. So as far as the role was concerned, I don't think Culver is likely to play a lot on this year's team. We've talked about this for a while. But there's not a, a ton of overwhelming wing depth on this roster if anything happened to DeAndre Hunter or Bogdanovich. Um, plus, the starting shooting guard is also the backup point guard in DeJounte Murray. So, a little bit of depth concern on some level. They obviously have A.J. Griffin as well. Um, I'd be interested to see what they would do if it came down to, like, Mo Harkless and Tyrese Martin and Jared Culver for some deeper wing minutes at some point. Obviously, I think Griffin would be ahead of him, clearly, at this point in time, in terms of, like, prioritization. But I would wonder what they would do there for some deeper wing, if they get into some injury stuff, etc., like last year. I would still guess that Culver plays most of his time in College Park, but he does have that experience to be playing at the NBA level. Maybe they want to keep him close by for some defensive help if they want to do that. So uh, it's all about the jump shot, and I don't want to overstate that, but it really is going to – I want to be very clear at this point in time. With his current jump shot, he's not really a prospect. If he fixes his jump shot, we will see, and I do like the move to go ahead and buy low on him at this point in time. With Culver in the mix and signed, the Hawks now have 18 guys on the roster for training camp. That is 14 roster players, uh, two two-way slots full with Culver and Trent Forrest, and then both Chris Silva and Tyson Etienne on Exhibit 10 contracts for training camp. Uh, they can carry as many as 20 for camp, but right now they have 18. It would not stun me at all if they wanted to just roll with these 18 guys. Going into camp with the two Exhibit 10s, Silva and Etienne are very different players in a lot of ways. And they still have the one roster spot open if they want to use it on a full roster spot guy, whether that be someone who's already on the roster now or who's close to it, or they just kind of leave it open for tax purposes. We talked about this a little bit earlier this week, but Zach Lowe kind of opined that they were going to get under the tax. I still believe that to be the case as well. And one of the ways they could probably do that the easiest is to leave that spot open at this point in time. So we'll touch on all of that later on. But that's my quick synopsis on the Jarrett Culver edition from Monday. We'll have all kinds of other topics coming up with my pals, uh, Andrew Kelly and Tower Jones, momentarily. But before we get to those guys on this show, and again, a two-part episode. This is part one. Part two is going to be in your feeds right now. Before we get to that, though, a word from our sponsors on the show. 
and the first of which is Bet Online. Football is here in a big way. Bet Online is the number one source for all of the pro and college football batting needs that you might have, along with the information that you definitely need this season. Find all the latest developments across the football world. That includes game matchups and news and podcasts at Bet Online, and that includes also everything you need for the weekend slates in college and pro football. Bet Online is a continued source for all the wagering information you need across sports. That includes live betting esports and live scores and bet online is the fastest and easiest way to consume every sport that you might be interested in on this show we focus on the nba for the most part there are plenty of futures out there still right now between season win totals and conference odds and division odds title odds playoff odds and even individual award stuff at this early juncture in the calendar and beyond the nba bet online has odds and lines on baseball and mma and boxing and golf and tennis and auto racing and horse racing soccer entertainment bets and much more head to betonline.net right now if you're a mobile device to learn more about all the trends and the action across the sports world bet online where the game starts all right in a locked on first i am joined by two guests here uh Not necessarily the first time I've ever done this, but it's been a while, and these two people that have been on the show together, two fan favorites, people were asking for this particular trio of people. I'm joined by both Tyler Jones and Andrew Kelly. Gentlemen, welcome for coming on the podcast. What's going on, Brad? What's going on, Andrew? Hey, y'all. Glad to be here. I, it's uh it's a mixture oh tower here comes here comes towers trademark lead here we go no you know I we gotta we have to start it off Brad. I just have a question because <laughs> you're still you still drinking the Falcons Kool Aid for some reason. I, I don't. I, don't I can't quit. I can't quit the Falcons. I don't that, cover them. It's my one. Sauce, it's my one thing to be that, mad about. That sauce must be still hidden for you because I watched the entirety of the Falcons Saints game, and I and I have to openly admit, I thoroughly enjoyed the Falcons losing that game. Not because I was rooting for them to lose, but I was rooting for Arthur Smith to fail because <laughs> I realized. I don't like him. And it might have something to do with, with uh, the fact that he's the son of a billionaire. That's, though that's not fair. It might have something to do with the fact that he treats the media like he's the son of a billionaire. So that might also be it as well. But he's also, I think, a poser because he's not a gamer. Like he claims he plays Madden. But clearly his decisions in late game situations suggest otherwise. So we'll just leave it there. I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, take too much of your time with Falcons talk, Brad, but I just, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm just, like, I should, I should hate the Saints more, but I don't, I, I, I hate your coach. So I, I have to apologize to, uh, to the Falcons fans that listen to the podcast. I will be rooting for, for Arthur Smith in particular to fail, not for the Falcons to fail, but for yeah. Arthur Smith. I mean, w- welcome to Locked on Falcons part two. That, that, that's that's actually Aaron Freeman's show. Shouts to Aaron Freeman. He's my listen to this podcast. Andrew, welcome to the uh, to the local Atlanta sports thing that you don't that you don't care about podcast because Andrew's not from Atlanta, so he's not a not a Falcons guy. Although I, I'm sure Andrew has fantasy interest in the Falcons. Yeah. Knowing Andrew, yeah, I just need the Kyle Pitts and Drake London to have good years. That's really it. You know, if Arthur Smith can uh, make them have good years, then he's the best coach for me. <laughs> there you go an, imp- an impartial arbiter here um but no i mean aside from the falcons being the falcons and doing what they always do in week one uh we're back to talk about the hawks you know look uh you guys may not know this media day is as we record this about a week and a half from now the hawks are going to open early because they go overseas to abu dhabi and uh because of that they get to er- they get to open preseason early so they actually going to be starting I believe it's a week from Friday. So we're about a week and a half away from media day. I'll be on the scene for all of the fun stuff there. And this is sort of a preseason uh, round table of sorts uh, to start I, off with. I'm going to ask you both. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tyler. Sorry. I just have a question. Uh, is Jalen Johnson alive? Uh, I was going to go there at some point on this podcast. Uh, are you referring to the fact there's a conspiracy? He's not been in any of the like Hawks promotional stuff. Is that what you're, is that what you're talking about? Yes, Brad. I don't know where he is. I, so I'm I'm just I'm just curious. I, I'm no, wondering. I uh, you know I, I don't really know either. This is the time of year when it is essentially impossible to get any intel from anyone because anything that happens in the gym, they're only going to release whatever they want to release on video or very 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 brief video, as you probably notice, or or still photos. Uh, but I mean, last I heard, Jalen was healthy again after the offseason injury. That's all I can give you. That's that's as far as I can go right now. I have not seen him. Uh, not talk to him um, as I've not talked to most players 
Uh, I've talked to a couple guys in little 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 spurts over the uh, over the summer, but he's not one of them. So I don't have uh, any intel. I'll know. I know Hawks fans are looking forward to the Jalen Johnson era starting in unison. Uh, sorry, starting in earnest. But um, I think the uh, the general hope on this podcast has been that he plays this year and it's not Mo Harkless. Uh, every time I talk about Mo Harkless, I get people yelling at me for talking about Mo Harkless. He's still on the roster though. So here we are. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was going to ask you sort of a good way to get into this. I, I was going to ask you both like how you're generally feeling because, you know, it's been a long cycle of the same topics. Like we talked about DeJounte Murray ad nauseum. We talked about the defense and everything new. And I know Tower has talked about John Collins because that's what Tower talks about all the time. Uh, but how are you both feeling? I guess we'll go to Andrew first. Andrew, how are you feeling about the Hawks in mid-September? Because camp's coming and we can't keep waiting to, uh, we're almost there. So it's time to like sort of gauge expectations. Well, the East keeps getting better. So I think yeah. that's a big thing since we last talked. I mean, obviously the Cavs get Donovan Mitchell. Uh, KD is staying in with, uh, with Brooklyn. So we're looking at a very strong conference. I think the Hawks have a, a team that can compete with them, but it's, it's, a type of year where you could win, you know, 46, 47 games and, and potentially even be in the play in. So it, it's hard to really frame expectations with regard to how good the East is. I tend to have them probably somewhere between the five to seven seed. It's hard to really shake that out. You know, I'm, I'm Toronto didn't really do anything, you know, so they're really betting on internal progress. Brooklyn, I mean, how many games are you going to get from KD is a big question with them. Yep. Um, the Cavs, obviously, they made some big splashes, but they, they may take some time to kind of gel and, I think they also just kind of caught teams by surprise at times last year too, in the early season, at least. And the bulls are at least, you know, respectable. So it, it's hard to really say how they stand in the East, but I do really like the starting lineup a lot. We talked about that last time on, I'm on the pod. So I think that if the bench can be solid, you know, and, and they don't get any key injuries to like their, their ball handlers and they could push for close to 50 wins. So it, it just really kind of depends on how the bench looks and you know, what you get from Deandre Hunter. Uh, all right Tyler it's time I know that was gonna trigger trigger Tyler right away we're uh we're recording this in a different way so I got, I got to see Tyler's reaction uh no I I generally agree and by the way there's this whole conversation happening I guess I in in flatly saying that I don't understand why the Cavs are projected to be so much better than the Hawks or also, Hawks fans got mad at me anyway for saying that the Hawks weren't way better than the Cavs it's just interesting to me but uh the casting is fun like I, I do think that uh that's maybe like a natural rival for the next little while for the Hawks I, I'm not saying we're not we're not quite there yet because like you know they haven't really done anything of note I mean they played the playing game and the Hawks beat them soundly but it's like maybe that's coming I, I, I've, I've sent some uh I don't know if it's just built in because of the way the trades happen or what I've sent Hawks fans are like kind of just like way anti cash right now which I understand I mean it's kind of a they're the other young team that kind of made a similar move and all that stuff but uh I don't know Tyler Go ahead on DeAndre Hunter or whatever else you whatever else you're loaded up. Uh, I, I think I think the Cav the Cavs is interesting because they they've clearly gotten a lot. Like to me, I feel like the Cavs both got a lot better, but it might not reflect in their record um, just because I, I I I do think they just that team just has structural issues that they're going to have to deal with. Like outside of their top four, I'm not really a fan of five through ten yeah basically everybody else on the roster um not to say they don't like they aren't like good in a vacuum but just the 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 pieces i i don't i like i think they're going to struggle to to put optimal lineups consistently on the floor at the same time so and also like i mean they're so young i mean i mean young in the sense that they haven't actually done anything in the terms (laughs) of you know, winning. winning I mean, they, they missed they missed the playoffs, yeah. playoffs last year. I mean, and yeah. I know they, oh, it's, they had a great start, and that was maybe. Uh, and look, it caught everybody off guard, including me. Like I was way too low on them last year. Maya culpa. They were way better than I thought they were going to be. But that, I think people almost forgot. Like they didn't even make the playoffs. They lost in the plan, and I think that's like kind of just out the window now. But well, I mean, they do have four all stars, so we we do need to. <laughs> and there need it is. There's the four all-star comment I was waiting like, for. It's, that is just a, a sign. I find that super weird that people do that. I mean, they do it with the Hawks, too. They, they say the Hawks have two all-stars. And it's like, team, like, unless you're a top 10 player, 15 or 12, like, I, I don't know if that d- designation means much if you make the all-star team because it's still, it's the top 15 lead that really decide who wins in a playoff series or not. Not not to say that the rest don't matter, but it's like, 
just like to me consistently, and I've said this to Andrew Kelly in his mentions, I've said this to you, I've said this to whoever, it's like, you know, there's not really that big of a divide between, you know, 25 through what, 75 or so. Like it, it's like a, rough, it's a deep league right now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's just like, to me, when people say like, Hey, this team has X amount of all-stars, it's like, yeah, that's nice. But the, the guys who really dictate wins and losses in this league, the Giannis is the Lucas, apologies, the Lucas, the, um, the Joel. Trey, I mean, Trey's, Trey's on the list. Yeah. Yeah. And Trey's there. Trey's there as well, because I mean, he, he, really doesn't get credit like he made all nba third team but i thought he was the best guard in the nba last year um he, i thought he had a real chance to make all nba first team and hopefully if the hawks like to me the biggest key for the hawks because the talent is all there and the pieces fit better and maybe roles will be more well defined with Dejounte murray really locking himself in as the clear number two option and also as a secondary ball handler creator guy who can really take pressure off of Trey Young. I really think like it's going to come down to injuries for me with the Hawks, but the nucleus of this team is good. Like I, I don't see why they can't be one of the best teams in the NBA. We'll see if they get there because they haven't, they, they've had 40 plus game stretches of being one of the best teams in the NBA, but they haven't been that for 82. So yeah, but if they can if they can put it de- together for an all 82, there's no reason why they can't have like a Suns like 55 plus win season. But that's on the super. Everything has to gel for them. And they also got to get contributions from guys. They're probably not going to ex- you can't really expect it for that to happen. There is still more to come with myself, Tyler and Andrew on this podcast. But first, let's talk about Steph Curry or Kevin Durant or perhaps LeBron James or Luka Doncic, maybe Jason Tatum or Giannis or Nicole Jokic or even local favorite Trey Young, who is always in the mix on this podcast. Who is the most valuable player in the NBA this season? Locked on and bet on live at the NBA top 50 most popular player list starting on September 19th. Find out all about it at Locked On NBA, wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. I want to ask you guys about like how obviously, you know, we talked about the Murray thing separately, the three of us in different ways, but like how this team might like operate a little bit differently. I know Tyler brought that up when we talked about this before the podcast, like just like playing style, how things might be different for like other guys, not even just Trey, because I think most of the focus has rightly been on the Trey Murray pairing and how that all works. And that does matter at a high level, of course, but like how Murray impacts other guys and how like he might impact the way that Nate operates is interesting to me, um, especially like guys like Collins, who have, you know, we've all kind of covered it ad nauseum, but like he has this, he's been playing this smaller role, but now he's got nobody behind him. That's a guy to circle, how it, how it affects the centers. Like, what do you guys think of like how Murray's impact goes beyond just the trade thing and just having another guy? Because I think we all kind of know the top line thoughts of, you know, top 35, top 40 player, whatever you, however you want to say that coming on board and the fit with Trey. But like, I, I've tried to touch on this a little bit, but like, how does he impact everybody else? And like, just kind of the overall style, because it's still Trey's team, but now they have this guy that's just like this very different force that they've had before. I mean, they're going to have to play faster. I, I, I wonder if, if everybody agrees, like, you know, Nate, he came in, um, the thing he changed in large part because, Gallinari really had to play with a slower pace. And also this is kind of typical of Nate McMillan coach teams where they, he just, he just nukes the pace of play for them. And they were like the slowest pace team in the NBA uh, when they were successful two years ago, I guess. So like to me with Murray, it's more opportunities in transition through defense, you know, creating steals, creating havoc plays on that end of the floor, grabbing goals, playing more in transition, playing faster and playing more opportunistic basketball instead of more controlled um, calling every play from the sidelines that they had been doing under previous. So it like, to me, this is, that's, that's what gets me excited about this, about this team is that one, they are going to play differently. And two, I think they're going to play, play freer, um, in a way where it's not just where it's not going to be so Trey centric um, of like it's just Trey in the half court running pick and rolls because they're going to have to play fast because Dejounte Murray is just not the Dejounte Murray is not the caliber of shooter to where you can just put him you know in the corner or put him on the you know at the top of the key alongside Trey Young and just expect 
you know, consistently positive outcomes. They're going to have to generate offense in a different way. But uh, that that's how I see it. But it it it'll be it that that's where the excitement comes from also because like it's going to be exciting to see them have to play differently because Dejounte is a legit threat with the ball in his hand. So like there's going to be some differences in in growing pains. But like to me, the key difference is going to be playing faster, which would allow for guys like John Collins to get more opportunities in transition, Capella and Akonwu to consistently get those opportunities in transition well. Like, I can see the bigs really excelling in a way that they haven't been able to um, during the Nate McMillan ten- tenure, um, you know, get more easier looks for them in transition, get more opportunities to run in, in uh, jail like that. It makes me laugh, by the way, that Nate always talks about how they want to play fast, and he just obviously does not want to play fast. Andrew, what do you think about the concept of them uh, maybe playing a little bit faster, You know, especially with like Murray giving them a grab and go option they, they just haven't had outside of Trey, who's just not the same rebounder that Murray is, obviously? That seems pretty intuitive to me. I mean, Murray's one of the best transition guys in the league, so it makes a lot of sense to feature that. I think more than anything, it's basically doubling down on high-level playmaking. Like That's really what you get from him. And when you look at their roster, I think that they've been constructed pretty well to feature that. Like they have very good play finishing bigs. They've had good shooters. They've had some capable secondary creators and guys like Wright and Herter and Bogey. So I think their roster overall is, is pretty well set up for that. And if you start to stagger it more and you get that advantage with bench with like bench lineups, that it, I think you get another edge there. Like the most easy thing to do for me would be basically to stagger Trey and DeJounte with one of a Kongu and one of Capella at all times, pretty much, you know, you can play DeJounte, a Kongu and three bench players and have effective lineups. And that really wasn't the case last year with, with that level of ball handler. So I think he really helps a Kongu probably more than anyone else. I just think that he'll line his minutes up a little bit more with him overall than perhaps a Kongu would with Trey. So I think having that level of ball handler is going to be big for him. It'll help Collins a lot. I think, when you look at the starting lineup, he probably, I, I think he probably does take less shots overall. But when you factor in that Gallinari's gone in the aggregate, this could be a pretty big scoring year for Collins just based on playing more minutes. So I think that he'll really benefit as well from, from playing with two really good ball handlers like that. So I think that's really the main thing is just it's a huge increase to their ball handling and their uh, playmaking. Yeah, and keeping those guys like anchor, you know, Okongwu, not that his – not that this always has to be the case, but he kind of had his first renaissance when he's played with Lou Williams a lot and kind of just got like build a rapport with someone who can handle the ball and run a pick and roll with him. And I think you're going to see that with Murray some. Obviously, he'll play with Trey some as well. But, you know, Kongwu, I mean, we all, I know all three of us really like Kongwu and value him. I'm in, I'm so intrigued to see Kongwu uh, after a full offseason to do work. Like he just hasn't, I know I've said it a lot of times in the podcast, but like it can't be overstated. Like, a guy that young who's ha- has had these injury stuff to have a full off season to get like just skill stuff done. And I, it's, I feel bad because it's so like, it's almost like it congruous to talk about an a Kong breakout or whatever like that, while also really valuing Capella and like thinking Capella is still good. And it's like this weird situation where they have these two centers who are both, you know, very good and kind of can't play together. <laughs> uh, but as long as you kind of stagger them appropriately. And like you said, kind of line one of them up to play, with Murray at all times and kind of have that. I mean, the only thing that's going to do is take away any small wall, like Collins center minutes. But th- those are kind of been dwindling anyway. The last, as soon as the Kong was really there, it's like no yeah. reason to really do that. Like, so as long as Collins, uh, sorry, as long as Capella and Kong were both healthy, that should be probably f- at least 46 of your minutes at center, maybe, maybe all 48 minutes of your center spot. Yeah. And that gives you a good baseline on both ends of the floor. Cause defensively, that means your anchors out there at all times too. And both those guys are really good. So that helps. And it makes sense to manage Capella more anyway. Like it's, it's logical to try to bring him down a little bit more minutes wise, just to try to preserve his impact level. So yeah, he came out last year too, from like 30 to 27 and a half or so. So he's, he's been declining every, and that's right. That's what you should do. Especially when you have a Kongu, like a Kongu being yeah. there, there's no reason to push Capella. I don't see it being like an even split or anything like that, but it'll be closer to, than people are expecting, in my opinion. I, I, I think it'll depend on a lot on if a Kongu uh, figures out how to consistently score the basketball. Um, like, I think more than the defensive rebound, because I, don't, I, I actually don't think he's going to be a bad defensive rebounder or even below average as a center. I, I think a lot of his issues were – as somebody who had the same surgery that he had, uh, I think a lot of his issues were strength-based uh, and that he didn't, he just didn't have the functional strength in his, in one arm uh, to do what he needed to do defensively on the glass. Um, so 
uh, a actual time to actually strengthen uh, uh, the, that area, those muscles uh, to get the to get back to where he was before he got hurt. Um, I think he he'll he'll excel there. But like, and we kind of saw in the playoffs with, with the Congo, like he kind of doesn't know where to consistently get offense outside of dump plays or lob threats. Like he he in, at USC, he was much better at finding his pockets consistently, finding those little areas, those for his little uh, floaters, his jump hook that he's really good at um, with both hands. And so ideally, if he's playing, if he's if he's finding more pockets to score, I think because weirdly, even though Nate's given the defensive aspect, like he's because Nate McMillan is considered a defensive coach. His rotations tend to lean offense. Um, we saw that with Dylan Wright, Lou Williams, and other scenarios. <laughs> he, I mean, even John Collins, uh, Danilo Gallinari. If, if Gallinari had it going from three, like Gallinari was going to play over John. That That's just kind of how Nate functioned as a coach. So I, I wouldn't suspect that if, if it's going to be even, um, a con who's re- really figured out a lane to consistently score. All right, that is all for part one. As I said before on the podcast, please stay tuned for part two with more from myself and Tyler Jones, as well as Andrew Kelly on a number of topics. As we continue this conversation, please subscribe to the podcast across platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, etc. And we'll see you next time.